but we can also listen to what you are recommending. So we're listening to us and then we'll uh, watch and join in the conversation. It's kind of word of mouth in action and happening on a podcast. Excellent. Now, the the moment I've been looking forward to the most is discussing Aha! The Movie. Aha, because the I, movie. I didn't even know that there was a demand for this or indeed that it was going to happen. <laughs> well, Because Aha! have kind those, of... Those are two separate things, right. aren't they? Oh, okay. okay. So anyway, tell us about <clears throat> well, Aha! The Movie. Let me ask, start by asking you, as one of the nation's top pop DJs... Yes, that's me. Aha! Fan? I like, I, I, yes, I mean, I like their, I haven't really tuned into any uh, can, stuff that they've been doing since Sun Always Shines on TV. Some time uh, ago. Take On Me, Living Daylights, but I thought that stuff, they did, they were a very good pop band. Okay. And Morton Harkett was a good fun, front man, but, but I'm not. Do you still play their bangers on Greatest Hits Radio? All the time. Okay, fine. So, I think that a good doc should interest you whether or not you're interested in the subject. Mm -hmm. And I have no interest in Aha at all. Okay? Morton Harkett's got good hair, though. Oh, actually, he's got good hair now, now that he's older and he's got quite a good sort of sh shortcut. When he had the big bouffant, you know, quiff mullet combination. No, you're, so, you're a little jealous. No, 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 no. Big, sidey, sticky out wings bit and a horrible. Just anyway, so describes following the band over a period of four years, sharing the full story of how three young men follow their impossible dreams of making it big. Almost 35 years after their breakthrough, they still create magic, but they tour the world but in separate cars and stay apart backstage, only meet on stage doing the thing they love. So it's the full story of the band. We go right back to the beginning. We learn how their early inspirations were Uriah Heep, The Doors. Uriah Heep? Uriah Heep. Good heavens. I know. <laughs> they have not been discussed on this show <laughs> before, I don't quite, think. Not enough of the heap. Um, uh, Hendrix. And yet somehow... With all those inspirations, they ended up sounding like aha. Um, there's loads of uh, animation because, of course, the you know Take On Me vids were been famously uh, You're right animated. Heap. My goodness. There's a lot of there's a lot of low level, very very polite complaining, which I think is partly a national thing. So keyboard player disconsolate because never wanted to be a keyboard player, but was told to be a keyboard player, so played the keyboards. Okay, they need to get out of Norway because it was too small for them. They went to London to become stars, then they came back because it hadn't worked out. There's a, there's a wonderful revelation that we learned at one point. There hadn't been a front harpist in pop before. A front harpist. A front harpist. That sounds, <laughs> that sounds quite vulgar. So there's a thing about how the Take On Me riff was originally known as the Juicy Fruit riff because it sounded like a Juicy Fruit commercial. Oh, I suppose so. And we get loads and loads of stuff about how it was, it was experimented on in different versions before it finally became the version that we know. Here is a clip discussing Morton Harkett's unique vocal stylings. I think it was Terry, you know, because he'd worked with Queen and he said, oh, whenever you have a falsetto, it's a guaranteed hit. And Morton had a wonderful falsetto, so I thought, you know, that could maybe be a cool thing, just to sort of show off his range a little bit, instead of every song, you know, you have a verse and every song wants to hit that money note. And I thought it would be cool to, instead of just going for that, just kind of start at the very lowest note you, you can hit and just build your way up from there. Take on me. You, have a, you don't have the... I don't have the gift. No. Um, so then that becomes... The first version becomes hit, hit in Norway, nowhere else. They worry if they've blown it. Then Steve Barron oversees the video. The first album sends, sells 11 million copies. There's a lot of stuff about how some of them still wanted to be an Echo and the Bunnymen. They released Manhattan Skyline as a single to prove that they're not a cartoon band and immediately lose the US audience. They described at one point as having the disease of being uncomfortable with their image. They say the songs are nice, but the videos are horrible. And they talk about allowing themselves to be humiliated in team pop settings. East of the Sun, do you know that album? I do not. A serious album. Is That's it? why you don't know it. I don't think I want a, a serious album by our heart. And gorgeously at that point, one of them says, we were flirting with you 2 ish stuff, but it comes from the wrong place. Which my reply is, there's a right place for flirting with you 2 ish stuff. Yes, now don't start on that again, because it's just unfair. MTV Unplugged, revisiting their back catalogue. They go their separate ways, painting, solo projects, more painting. Suddenly, they had this one lovely moment where said it seemed like every AHA fan had turned into a journalist. So Chris Martin, Coldplay, U2, Oasis, Kanye... All apparently saying that, uh, you know, they're a much better band than they thought they should have been. They were washed up, then Foot of the Mountain becomes a hit. 
and then they go on a they go to 2009 they go on a farewell tour five years later they're back again here's the thing there are pop documentaries and there are pop documentaries okay this is <laughs> in the best possible sense this is like watching a documentary about a corporate meeting in which everybody i mean they just happen to make pop music but everybody is really well behaved the most the closest it becomes to kind of a, you know, like in an Oasis documentary, they'll all be effing and jeffing and calling each other names. Or in that thing, you know, Dig, the that fantastic documentary about the Dandy Warhols and the Brian Jones St. Massacre, in which they're breaking into each other's houses and stealing each other's equipment. The worst thing that happens in this is that one of them objects that a bit of their song is used in somebody else's song, but then they're overruled. There's, there's no... Maybe they're just nice guys. Maybe they are just... You don't have to absolute, break the law to have fun, Mark. No, the grievances are all utterly standard. There are discussions about w w writing top-line melodies and not getting credited for it. It's, yeah. th it's that... Thr now, compare this to the Bross documentary. And I never bought a Bross record. The Bross documentary had me, f from the word go, conversation corner. <laughs> the yeah, chair. but they, no, it's because, because it was funny. It was because it was funny and charming. And actually what you got out of it was this sense of these slightly, you know, off the wall characters in, in this mad circumstance. But it was really funny. And the Spandau Ballet doc, you know, um, Playboy's the Western World, which I thought was, you know, really, I was never a huge Spandau Ballet fan, but I loved that documentary. This, it is, aha, uh -huh, blah, blah, blah. It's just like... OK, yeah, that just confirms for me everything I ever thought. They're all very good musicians. So basically, if you're an AHA fan, you'll probably enjoy it. Yeah, and if you're not an AHA fan, you'll just not bother. No. But OK, but therefore fails my fundamental rule, which is a great documentary will make you interested in a subject which you had no... How does it I, compare with ABBA the movie? Uh, see, I've got a fondness for ABBA the movie because I remember seeing it on the big screen and wanting to see ABBA up on the... You know, you mentioned Living Daylights. There's... there's uh, Probably the biggest revelation in it is that they fell out with John Barry. Okay. Over what? Uh, they, they said that in his arrangement of their composition, there was a chord that one of them particularly liked, and when he orchestrated it, that chord got lost, and they then had to manipulate an 80-piece orchestra I'd, in order to get them to play a different I'd note. I'd be very cross about that. And I mean, that. if that's not edge of the season, look, Simon Paul isn't even listening. No. This is so dull that he's actually he's actually going off. Anyway, it's in selected cinemas. Selected cinemas. Yeah. Very selected cinemas. Very selected cinemas. <laughs> uh, okay. Like the Spinal Tap audiences. They haven't got smaller, they've just got more selective.